starting recording on OBS now. Going live on Daniel Anderson Facebook page now with Clay Edwards tagged. Going live on YouTube now. On Save Jackson. Clear. Clear. Going to start recording on the mixer in five, four, three. We are here. For the first, well, it's the first again. <laughs> the, the return of uh, the Clay Edwards Uncensored podcast. And uncensored doesn't necessarily mean bad language. It just means uninterrupted, no commercial breaks, no topics off limits. And I am here with the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only, the, the real Rush Limbaugh of Mississippi, Kim Wade, a.k.a. Radio Strongman. What is up, brother? How you doing, Clay? Uh, as you're affectionately known around the studios, the Romanian radio uh, was a Rambo. I'll take it. <laughs> I've been called worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clay, Clay, you, I'm really impressed with what you've done over the last couple of years, man. Uh, you came out of nowhere. Matter of fact, I did not know that you were actually doing a podcast at WYAB on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it turned out, uh, you know who actually brought you to my attention was uh, our friend Bobby Guillory. Yeah. Yeah. We were at uh, Jiu Jitsu, and I don't know how it came up. And he said, yeah, he's got the podcast. And I said, <laughs> turned out I, d I didn't know. He was telling me about it. And so uh, uh, and when I found out that that's what it was and then you're interested in getting into radio, and I was telling Matt, I said, I think this guy has legs. Turns out you do. Well, you're I doing quite well, sir. I appreciate it. You, know, we, you had sent me a clip earlier. I don't remember the fellow's name, but he was he was talking about the Shannon Sharp. He was talking about Terry Crews. Mm -hmm. Terry Crews, yeah. his interview with Shannon Sharp on Club Shay Shay, and he was like talking about people being offended now and retro complaining about money they agreed to work for. And Terry's like, man, I was in training day for free, and that catapulted my career because like when the when they did the scene at the Oscars and it had Denzel in that scene, mm -hmm. Terry was the only other person in the picture. Right. And it just did wonders for his career, mm -hmm. and he said, "I've never, I've never complained about money I agreed to." That's right. And he, I, he said, the, "The work I did for free catapulted me to where I'm at now," and that's kind of how I have felt through this whole ride through the media. Mm -hmm. I, I did it because I wanted to. It was a right. passion. It was a calling. People say being a nurse, a doctor, or a nurse, a fireman, a cops, a calling. I felt like having a voice right. was a calling, and you know, I kind of guided through life up to about 2020, and like most people, I, I got tired of being told don't believe my lying eyes mm -hmm. about what was going on in the world. Right. Oh, this COVID is the deadliest pandemic in the history of, of, of the world, and people are just falling out dead, walking That's in the right. streets. I got up and went to work every day, and I never saw none of that. Yeah. Nobody I worked with died. And frankly, nobody uh, stayed home when they were sick either. Right. So, you know, you just, I was like, just said, something ain't right here. Something ain't, something ain't right. And then, yes. of course, the George Floyd stuff happened. And that really woke a lot of people up, myself included, more so than ever. And at that point, I was just running that Save Jackson page, posting pictures of old buildings and just as a creative outlet or something. Right. Didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, if you had told me that it was going to end up where, the, where I'm at, I would have called you a liar. But, you know, you say yes to enough opportunities and you don't complain about it along the way. You don't complain about the money you're making. Well, you know, one of the things uh, – about life in general is how you view it, how you see what you're seeing through your own eyes. Uh, you have a tendency to just look at things as, okay, let's see what happens. Take advantage of the opportunities that come off here. You're always looking out the corner of your eye for the opportunity that's right there in front of you as you do whatever it is, do life. You know, one of the things, I met you when you were like 22 or 23 years old, you know, yeah. when, back in the early 2000s. And uh, I noticed then that you had that gleam, that, that drive. And that's why when it turned out that you were at the uh, radio station doing podcasts on the weekends or recording podcasts, uh, and I was telling uh, Matt about you, it was because of that, that what I saw in you 20-something years earlier. And the podcast that you're referring to is a podcast. The podcast, his name is Antoine Daniels. He has a couple of them. I think one, this one here that you saw was the millionaire show that he has in the morning where he talks the about. Millionaire in the morning or more yeah, millionaire or something like that. Yeah. Right. Antoine Daniels. Uh, he's out of Detroit. And uh, he was, uh, I guess, handicapping the interview that 
Terry Crews did with uh, Shannon Sharp, Shay Shay Club, Shay Shay. That's really blown up. It really has. I didn't think it was going to be the thing. And right. Kudos to him for flexing all of his, making people comfortable when they sit down. Right. It ain't up to him to call them out on lies. It's up to the <clears> public <throat> to decide if they don't like what they're saying. Right. And and he's a good interviewer, you know. And see, that's the thing about it. People have a tendency to want to categorize people and say, oh, that person's not this or that person will never do that. The main thing is, what do you think about yourself? What do you answer to? Like people use the N-word or whatever kind of uh, uh, pejorative somebody may use against you. If you respond to it, if you answer to it, then okay, it's obviously a problem with you. But if you know who you are, and many people just don't know who they are. They don't have a compass. They don't have a moral compass that points due north or it's probably spinning like a lathe. And that's a problem for them. Life deals them bad hands, and they don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. You know, so let me – Kim mentioned I met him 20 years ago. It was I think it was more like 98, 98 99, because mm-hmm. I got opened up Crazy 8 in 01. It was after that, but mm-hmm. before that that I met you. Kim has actually been a guiding light twice in my career. Mm-hmm. He helped giving me a chance when he owned the club Jazzies to come in there and promote a night, Thursday night's college night. Mm-hmm. And – I saw that I had the ability to get a crowd out there. Now, we couldn't keep them from fighting one another, and that eventually <laughs> kind of led to the end of that, that deal. But that was, it was neither one of our faults. But it showed me, hey, I got the oomph to do this. This guy let me ex- fail or succeed. Fast forward, end up owning a club for 15 years. Mm-hmm. Then, lo and behold, I, I get to messing with a little podcast and stuff, and I'd actually done a <coughs> couple radio shows at me and Napoleon Polo <laughs> had a little thing on Sundays on WPBQ or uh, I think it's PBQ anyway the one over there on fifty five yeah on from Cowboy yeah WPBQ I think that's yeah. it uh, at Briarwood mm-hmm. oh okay yeah so we, we we did that on Sundays for a little while through the summer of twenty twenty when everything was just peak insanity right. and having the audacity to be the white guy um, playing the playing the villain role. <laughs> Uh, it, it did wonders for me. Uh, right. Well, but just being honest, but you couldn't be honest then. You were the bad guy if you were remotely honest and you questioned any of the narrative right. about COVID or George Floyd or just any of that stuff that was going on. But anyway, so that just kind of ended. It was hard to meet up and do Sunday thing. I was like, well, I'm going to start the podcast. So I started calling it the Save Jackson podcast and it pre recorded. And I, was, I knew the power of radio. And I wasn't listening to a whole lot of conservative talk radio at the time. I've still been a podcast, YouTube guy, all right. that. Found WYAB. I sent a random email to info at WYAB.com and mm-hmm. explained what I was looking to do. Matt emailed. Actually, Matt called me. Matt's the owner of the station. When we mentioned Matt, he owns WYAB, uh, one of the just best human beings, mm-hmm. good, quirkiest, good most heart. unique. Good heart. Uh, yeah, absolute great heart. True patriot um, mm-hmm. and for allowing us to do what we do uninterrupted, unabated. <laughs> as long as we don't uh, offend the FCC. <laughs> and I uh, reached out to Matt. I bought an hour every Saturday morning. I was the lead into LSU football. Mm-hmm. There was just enough crazy drunk Cajuns listening to me, waiting on the pregame to come on that made a couple fans out of them. Uh, it garnered <laughs> a little interest and started doing um, the, the uh, every Monday was live. Right. It was a one, one show a week for an hour, seven to eight on Mondays, and then expanded to two hours, to f- two days a week, to three, four, five days. I have worked up. Right. It didn't just, I was not handed two hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember having lunch with Kim one day at Martin's downtown, one of our favorite little spots there, best lunch in town and best lunch in Jackson anyway. And I asked him, I said, look, you think you can talk to Matt? I, I think I want to do this full time. He's like, well, I think you got the chops. And I was still working. And mm-hmm. so this is twice in my life that Kim has been a huge influence. And he did speak to Matt, as he, as he said. He helped, he helped me find my confidence in the nightclub business, mm-hmm. as well as um, – my confidence helping me being a, being a mentor and uh, extending his, uh, extending his hand, you know, and talking to Matt and put kind of putting his name on the line a little bit. Hey, this guy's not going to screw it up. I, I trust him. And mm-hmm. it's been, it's been, a, it's been three years ago. Yeah. February was three years. Just it's as a, a side note, uh, that one night a week that you uh, came and brought your crowd to my club, I paid. All, I could pay all my bills for one month off that one night. Mm-hmm. Like I said, now your crew, your posse, your folks that follow you, and, th- and this is what I learned about the business: uh, a white crowd. When you start seeing the the boys, the men coming there, taking off their shirts, somebody's going to get knocked the hell out. Yeah. Okay, the black crowd is just going to be gunfire ringing out, people scattering. <laughs> so uh, those are little peculiarities that you know the whole life experience brought to us, but. 
again, I, I do appreciate it. Uh, you know, you have uh, negotiated and navigated the social structure here in Jackson. Blacks and white people hate you one day, love you to another, and vice versa. Uh, Kenny Stokes always said, I've got as many black enemies as i got white enemies. And, you know, that's kind of when you start hitting that medium where you're, you're being effective. And so at the end of the day, Remaining true to yourself and what you believe you want to do and just go for it. You, Chris Carr, you guys probably about in that, you know, same general uh, general area in terms of age. And we still get along very well, me and Chris. He's, right. he's had my back throughout the years right. without rolling him under the bus here, right. you know, hurting his image any, but he's he's been very good to me. Right, right. And you both had that drive and, you know, for the most part, you've been self-employed for the most part. I mean, and – in life, when you're self-employed, you actually wake up unemployed every morning. You got to make something happen, and so that's one of the qualities that you two have that I, I admire. But to make a long story short, it is reason why I am so adamant about what I believe and what you hear me talk about on the radio program, as relates to America. Uh, this America is the home of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth chances. All you have to do is just keep getting up. Does not mean that you don't get knocked out, get knocked down get dogged out, get mistreated, get stabbed in the back, but the opportunity to come back. And I like the folks who get back up. That's what I love about Trump, man. You know, people say what they will about Donald Trump, but you know what? I was thinking about it this morning. <sighs> All the things that we think about ourselves when we assign ourselves to be a good people. Clay's a good guy. Kim's a good guy. Kim thinks he's a good guy. Yada, yada, yada. But the qualities that we would measure that, designation of being a good guy Trump has met all those you know and we don't want many don't want to uh, give him his props for remaining true to what he believes and succeeding at it okay so when you actually believe and you stand on it and then other people say man oh I knew you could do it yeah but you gave me all that opposition I knew I could do it if not I knew I was going to die trying to do it and so Many people don't realize that they fail on the same scale that they measure themselves and think themselves as a good person. They fail on that same scale against Trump. With, I mean, using their own criteria. Mm -hmm. They couldn't go back a week on me and go through all my posts and life and everything else with, without finding something that they could put me in jail on. All that they've done against Donald J. Trump, for instance, they had to make up lies to get these 91 charges against him. None of them are grounded in reality and or the law. You know, I want to say something, too. Kim has stuck by that since January 6, 2020, 2019? Yeah, 2021. 2021. 2021. Since January 6, <clears throat> 2021, Kim has stood by that. And I'm going to tell you, I even had doubt for a little while. I was like, if it's just too intense. Surely they wouldn't just lie about all this, even me, as much mm -hmm. as a believer as I am. Right. Uh, there was just times where I thought, Maybe it's time to move on right. to the next phase. And Kim, Kim saw through all that, and you're seeing it unravel in front of your eyes with the Supreme Court's decision, mm -hmm. with this Fannie Willis stuff, mm -hmm. with the immunity deal with the Supreme Court. Right. I mean, you're, you're seeing this whole thing come undone. And even my uh, my Democrat co-host a couple of days a week, Sean Yerkeron, mm -hmm. says the same thing as a former prosecuting DA. He said, man, I, I, I don't think they get a single guilty plea. I mean, a, a guilty verdict here at right. all. Right. Right, and, you know, and see, things that no con ends up being no contest on all. Right, mistrials, whatever. And see, and what Trump and it, it just amazes me because I would have lashed out at somebody by now. I mean, I would have cold cocked someone. You know, uh, Trump obviously knows something deep within him that okay, I'm gonna stand here. They're gonna do all they're gonna do, and I'm gonna stand. You know, the man put his he's literally put his life and his fortune, his family's fortune, his legacy, on the line. And he didn't have to do it. He could have, regardless of whatever system America devolves, evolves into or devolves into, socialism, communism, whatever kind of ism it is, with his kind of money, he would be above the fold, okay? So he would be a part of whatever the ruling apparatus would be. But that wasn't what motivates him. And so that's what I'm saying. Man, I got to take my hat off to the brother, man. And it ain't got nothing to do with race. It's about the character. And I love a man who's, uh, you know, I love strong people. I love strong men. I love strong women. People who will stand for what, ten toes down for what they believe, regardless of the consequences. Even if I disagree with you. Right. I, I can appreciate your consistency to your cause. Stokes. 
Kenny Stokes, Stokes is like that. You know, there are 100%. a lot of people like that, you know, who will who will stand and say, this is what I believe. I don't care what you believe. Yeah, yeah the Stokes thing is a great, a great analogy. You want to be polarizing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're a polarizing individual, too. I mean, you have as many – White people that hate you and black people that hate you that, that love you. That's right. And I, and that, that is I, I've looked at the successful people in this business, and that's why I've said I want to want to be like that. Even Trump on a different degree. Right. You know, I, I said this morning on the radio show. I've said it a hundred times, you, and maybe I, maybe I got this from you. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I've said that I judge a man by who his enemies are. Versus his friends, you can have fake friends. Mm, your, your enemies are always going to. Yeah, they can. They're going to hate you. Honestly. Serious. <laughs> they, they, they're going to honestly hate you. And I can look who, at who hates Trump, mm-hmm. and I can look at who hates you and who hates me, and say we're in damn good company. And even who hates Stokes sometimes. That's right. That's right. You know, it's like you can look at him. So like, I don't ever want those people. I saw Ashton Pittman with Mississippi Today. I think that's who he's with, yeah. or J- Mississippi Free Press, or one of them, mm-hmm. uh, gay Democrat um, media member here in town in, mm-hmm. in Mississippi. He was kind of commending our our folks down at the Capitol for some of the bills they've passed mm-hmm. this this session. And I said, you know, if they're in a super red state, if that bunch is ever happy with what you're doing, that you're doing something wrong. Right. They should never his 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 crew, Democrat, not the gay part, the, his crew <laughs> should never be happy. Right. As hard, far left as they are, yeah. they should never be satisfied with anything that comes out of that capital. And we've done a, it's been a failure right. if they're happy with anything. You know, the thing about it, when, when a state or an entity is all red or all blue, for instance, um, in the case of the Democrats, they just realize, well, what we need to do is run us a Delbert Holzman. We will run it. There's a Republican now in Porsche there. Uh, it's not early voting. It's where you, oh, you can vote. Uh, in person before the election, which it sounds good on its surface. There's nothing wrong with that uh, on its surface. But when you sit back and think about it, when you allow anything other than voting on election day, you essentially open yourself up to card counting in a, like card counting in a casino. Okay. If the registrar or the election commissioner or the circuit clerk is not, let's just say fair, they say, okay, now we got all these votes, early voting coming in from 39211, predominantly white or more white than the rest of the Jackson area. Uh, so that means that these people are getting out. We need to offset it with whatever, if we got to insert votes. So that's the hazard in that. Now, this guy's a Republican. You would think, okay, he's doing the best thing. The bottom line is we just need to have elections on election day, count the votes that come in on that day, plus the absentee. Those are the people who... Traditionally, can't go to the polls. They're going to be out of town. They're disabled. I had yada, to vote yada, absentee yada. once in right. uh, 16. I was going to be in Houston for finance school. Right. I had to vote absentee. It kind of spoiled me. I was like, I think I want to do this again. Then, of right. course, uh, COVID happened, and that wasn't possible. But, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm all for the absentee stuff. You're right. You're 100%. I think it should be a national holiday. Yeah. You should not be able to get fired mm-hmm. for, for going to vote. Right. Like, no, I got to go vote, dog. True, true that. I mean, if we can do Juneteenth and all these other uh, uh, holidays just on a spur of the moment, Certainly, this would be worthy of it. That's that's actually a good idea. But just remember that uh, when you have an all red state, all blue state, particularly when you have an all red state, the Democrats would just pretend to be Republicans and come over and do their dope boy magic over there. And that's what we're seeing happening here. You don't see that happen in blue states, though. No, yeah, because Republicans, for the most part, <sighs> this is really going out there on some thin ice. For the most part, from an integrity standpoint, won't do that. But Democrats, look. <laughs> Even laboratory rats look down on Democrats sometimes for some of the things they do, you know. Yeah, I mean, you, you make a good point, but, man, I tell you, looking at some of the stuff the rhinos are doing, it's, you can call me a lot of things. You ain't never going to call me a Democrat. Yeah, yeah those I, five I words. I yeah. want money. I'd like to have a little power. Who, who wouldn't, you know, as long as you're putting it to a good use, but you ain't going to call me a Democrat to get there. Well, you know, uh, when my girls were growing off to college, I told them, and <laughs> people think I'm kidding, I told them I'd rather for them to come back home crackhead whores <laughs> than come back a Democrat. Okay. Because I've seen people come out, get off crack and meth and things, yeah. but becoming a Democrat, bruh, I'm <laughs> sucking my teeth. <laughs> it's tough, man. It's tough. I, look, I, I, I've never steered my daughter any certain direction. Right. Um, so that wasn't the conversations we had, but I, I lived my life the way, well, at least the, the, sec, the last 10 years or so, I lived it the way. 
that I would want her to live hers. Right. And I just remember during the, it was 2015, 2016, right in that run, she told me she wanted for her birthday, and it was a Make America Great Again shirt. Mm. I was okay. like, I've done it. <laughs> it was one of the proudest moments. Yeah, I mean, seriously. Not because seriously. she wanted a Trump shirt, but because she she knew the difference in right and wrong and left and right. Right. Well, you know, I was listening to, uh, uh, and I, I got a clip, hopefully I get to play it today on today's show. Uh, and this woman's a liberal. She's written a book. I can't think of the name of her book. But she and she talks about the Trump phenomena. Do you remember her name? Uh, it's an Indian name. Okay. Uh, I was going to say we can get Daniel to Google it. but Yeah, yeah. Um, but mainly, the main thing she, she points out, and she's just handicapping Trump in terms of why he's effective. She, and she makes the point that, you know, for the longest, the Republican Party was uh, associated with the business community. But those were the traditional industries, steel, auto, places like that. The new tech industry is aligned with the Democrats, and that's one of the things she points out. So when the Republicans were aligned with big business, many of the working class people in America felt like Republicans didn't care for the working class person. And now it's just the opposite. You know, they're talking about the party switching. Well, now you got the Democrats getting all this big tech money, uh, and big tech, as you know, really still helped steal the election in 2020. And so now it's big tech that's part of the money class, and they look down their nose at working folks like you and I. And this is why Trump has that appeal, because there's still more of us than they are of them. But because they control the apparatus of the media, et cetera, it seems like they're bigger than they are. But we just have to stand. And you see what happens when we stand. We get victory. Well, we know what Mark Zuckerberg did during the last election, the Zuck Bucks right. and all that. Let me ask you a question. I get a lot of blowback from conservatives because I chose to tackle TikTok mm-hmm. and make that a, a, a formidable platform to talk to younger people. Instead of saying, you got to come to where I'm at, I said, I'm going to go to where they're at. Right. And I get compliments about it all the time from parents mm-hmm. who say, man, my, my kid watches you on TikTok. Thank you for what you're doing. Mm-hmm. I got a message on the way over here from my fellow. And it, so that makes me, makes me smile. But I, I say that to say this. I catch a lot of flack about it because of China and because Trump said we needed to ban TikTok. Mm-hmm. Kim, I, I trust China more than I trust DC, Silicon, Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, Google, mm-hmm. Facebook. All this, all these big tech companies, you know. Of course, YouTube is Google. Uh, again, I'd, I'd rather China have my information than these than these. That's this point here. Everything is everything is anytime anything that pulses digitally and you can plug in or you can plug in rather uh, is is subject to manipulation and confiscation. You know that was my like 15 years with the phone company. Last five was in voice. First 15 was in data. So I got in on the rudimentary side of where I understand the concepts of data transmission, et cetera. When we talk about the new data plants, for instance, that's coming in here in Mississippi, it's a big deal, yada, yada, yada. But they're putting them everywhere. And the reason why they're putting them everywhere because they're monitoring anything that nothing goes away now. So We're, we're talking about the Amazon data. Yeah, the, am, am, it, the, the Amazon data, data center is America. It, it's the CIA. Tell me. I have a rudimentary idea of what it is. What is a data center? Data center is just a lot of room full of servers where they're collecting every, they're going to be collecting this podcast. Mm-hmm. Whatever the text when you sent me to tell me the address, all that's going to, it may seem like meaningless scraps of paper, but no, if they ever want to get you, they're going to play your life. Just like when you're watching the Tom Cruise movies and he's, you know, they got the big screen of all the CIA folks watching you all over the world and putting cameras in your bathroom. What was that movie, I, God's Eye of God? Uh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Hollywood will tell you right. what they're doing to you. They may, it, But they tell you in such a early stage of it. Yeah. It's hard to appreciate how true it is. You know, I know it's popular for us to go back and say the Terminator movies – with AI and all, it's like they literally told us John Connor is looking at us like we're all idiots right now. Well, the ideals the came from somewhere. And, they did. You know, uh, what I've, and that's one of the reasons after January 6th, actually Facebook had me in Facebook jail for the month of January, which turned out to be a blessing. Because otherwise I'd have been on there typing the incendiary things. Yeah. And, you know, they'd have me hemmed up. Um, I ended up in Facebook jail on January 6th for the things I said. Is that right? Yeah. Well, it as wasn't it turned, much in the big picture, but yeah, I mean, I was in Facebook jail like eleven out of twelve months. And I'm saying, wait a minute, they're monetizing me and then punish me at the same time. Yeah. I feel like snowball. I'm getting beat and made love to at the same time. <laughs> well, that's why I, when I when I announced, I, I didn't announce who my guest was. I wanted to be a little bit of a surprise right. for folks. 
<laughs> but when I announced this podcast, bringing this video podcast back, and of course mm. it's going to be available on audio forms as well. Just search Clay Edward Show wherever you download everything. Mm. It'll be there. But uh, one thing I said is I'm not posting this to Facebook. I'm, I'm not uploading to Facebook. I know we're streaming live on the Audio Alchemy page. I'm not giving them that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, well, you I'm can always do the reels. Content. And sh- you can do reels and shorts. Yeah. And just, just to draw attention to it. At we the end of the day, this. yeah. At the end of the day, it, it comes down to how to everything is data, and everything, and all data is money. And th- when you start looking at it from that standpoint, whether you're on TikTok, see China, you know, people's aversion to TikTok because of China connection. China is the model for governance. That's what the globalists. That's what Mitch McConnell. That's what all these people are serving us up for. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, the open borders. All this crap is leading us towards a situation where in China, you're good to go as long as you make the damn iPhones and the Nikes, go home, shut your mouth. But see, opinionated guys like you and I are going to have a problem in that type of environment. Sure. But some people who are your run-of-the-mill Democrat kids, dude, <laughs> they're going to be at home because yeah. all they do is do what they're told. Yes, sir, boss. Yes, sir. So, <laughs> you know, this is the reason why people like – you and myself and others, this is why we fight like a fish in a net now. That's why I don't do various topics that I used to do. I used to stress. Now, today I'm going to talk a little bit about Medicaid expansion on my show. But for the most part, the die is set. I'm telling people now, from my vantage point on the totem pole, what we need to be doing now is preparing for throwing some sharp elbows, moving some furniture around, and maybe using some tourniquets on our brothers and sisters who who might get wounded in the in, in the melee, but something's getting ready to jump off. The status quo can't stand. Uh, look, I, I, I'm not getting bogged down in every little bill at the Capitol. Yeah, you know, I, it is. We're in the middle of a culture war. Yeah. I mean, it's we're already there. We're we're in World War Three. It's digital and deep state. It's not hand to hand combat, but it, it's it's heading there, and it's going to happen. I'm on record. It's going to happen between November 5th mm-hmm. and January 20th. Mm-hmm. That, it, it, that, that that is going to be. W- w- there will be blood is the name of the movie. Yeah, that's just my opinion. I w- whichever, whichever. Well, they side. play for keeps, and I tell people they kill babies. They have no problems with killing anybody, and this is what I keep trying to explain to the black community. And I get accused of putting black people down, and that is, out of all the people in America who should know who we're dealing with in terms of the Democrat Party and what they're capable of, capable of is the black community. But for whatever reason, we won't take counsel. We don't. We won't believe our lying eyes that these people are evil. The things they're doing to Trump are the things they perfected on us, and we should be avert. I mean, the aversion to what they're doing to him should be palpable, uh, and that's why Trump is starting to peel votes away as as it relates to black males. Because you know, dude, we were the tip of the spear that w- that, that was getting pierced by these devils. Now I call white Democrats devils. I say it unabashedly because. If they're not the devil, they'll do to the damn devil gets here. The things that they continue to do to humanity. I mean, it's just one evil act after another. And if you sit back and study the history of America, every group that has been put upon at the behest of the government has been at the behest of a Democrat government. Indians, women, blacks, the policies, the legislation, et cetera, it all comes from them. Democrats have the, I mean, Republicans have their issues in terms of benign neglect or indifference. In many cases, Republicans just say, look, here's the door of opportunity. Let those who will come, come on, go through it. But people gotten in their mind, oh, I got to have a door that says Clay Edwards on it or Kim Wade or gay or brown. Conservatives, for the most part, don't do that. This is the door of opportunities. Let, let those who will come. I like it. I like it. Kim, you spent some time. I'm going to jump into DeLorean and go back in time for a minute. Mm-hmm. You didn't just wake up this hardcore black conservative or conservative. I don't like the black term, but you actually spent time in the Nation of Islam, right? I did. From 79 to about 95, 96. It was 15 years. The latter part, towards the end, it was more, I wasn't a participant so much as I was. Just, I wasn't, let's just say I returned home to Christianity in 96. So, Say four or five years prior to that, I didn't go to church, but I wouldn't go outside on Sundays before church let out because I didn't want no people. I didn't want people to know that I wasn't affiliated with a church, and I wasn't going to the to the nation. I wasn't going to uh, mosque or activities anymore. 
And I got disenchanted. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell that part of it. And yes, I did. I joined the Nation of Islam the weekend that I graduated from college. We graduate, I mean, um, graduated on Sunday. Then that following weekend, I joined the Nation. So it was on May 7th, 79. And then I guess that would have been May 13th of 79 is when I officially joined. Minister Farrakhan spoke on the 4th of May, 1979. And he spoke for three hours. And one of the things that he said that really, let's just say it caused me to join was, he said, there's no unemployment problem in the black community. There's an attitude problem. There's plenty of work to be done. But if you have the idea that until you get paid $300 an hour because you're a lawyer, an engineer, or whatever, there may not be any work for you. But there's still plenty of work to be done. And I like that. And I also I like the do for self. Do for self is, con is as conservative as it gets, but it's also consistent with what I learned at the dinner table about doing for self. Everybody's got to, you got to put something into, the, you can't sit, just sit here and eat for free. And so all that was consistent with, with my worldview up to that time and how I was reared. So, yeah, I joined the nation, but what separates the nation? Because there are some, obviously, some, some core conservative values, right. nuclear family, uh, frankly, not not being gay, mm -hmm. you know, just being a man, right? Being being a responsible, self serving, scripturally you know, sound roles. Uh, what separates women. them from like a traditional conservative uh, is because it feels like growing up a white conservative in the South. You know, we were just kind of not taught this at home, but just uh, the assumption was they're racist. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a Republican. They don't like me. But as I've gotten older, you know, I realized, man, I I don't know what the some maybe some of the extreme stuff mm -hmm. I, I'm not down with, but the core values of the nation. I'm like I don't know, man. That lines up pretty well with, with 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 my worldview. Well, what we're talking about here are principles, mm -hmm. and the principles of the of the nation is the principle of righteousness. It's the principles of which our founding fathers uh, derived the founding documents. Those the 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 thought, the philosophy, the universal and spiritual principles came out of that. So there's no daylight in between what you're saying in terms of your rearing uh, in a conservative household and what the uh, Nation of Islam believes and what many conservatives say they say they believe. So there is no there is no difference. This is why when you, you mentioned earlier in the show about uh, what I had said about the Trump on J6 and the, uh, the correctness of his position and yada, yada, how he would be all right. And it's based on these un understanding about principles. Principles don't change simply because somebody else or a group of folks get up there and say, hey, this is what we really believe. Doesn't make any difference. This is why I can say with all the certainty that I can muster that Congressman Benny Thompson, Derek Johnson, and many of these others are going to be humiliated for the stances that they take, that, that they have taken against what is right. Uh, Benny railroading these people on J6 with these bogus investigation and charges, he thinks that there's no price to pay for that. But he's going to be in violation of universal and spiritual principle. And uh, what I've learned, in, what I learned in the Nation of Islam and in the Quran is that no matter what you say you believe, you're going to get tested. Everybody gets tested. I get tested. Uh, the same humiliation that's available to Benny Thompson is available to me if I don't line up with those universal principles. So I just anticipate a, a big Boom. That's when I tell black folks, the course we're on cannot be sustained. It feels good, and everybody around you feels the same way. But when you're involved in illegality, excuse me, criminality, wrongdoing, you have a tendency to think everybody's doing it. In fact, everybody in your world is doing it. But all you're gonna, what's going to happen is you're going to run across somebody who's not down with that, and they're going to upset your whole world. Well, you know, there's just there's not enough of them to keep treating everybody like they are. Hmm. I mean, inevitably – just have to assume there's going to be some backlash at some point. Right. It's like, you know, it, it, it's, everybody's going to get self-serving at some point, mm -hmm. and it ain't going to work out for the people who have been dishing <clears> out. <throat> you just can't imagine it is. But then again, it, it may. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of crazy people on my side that – I say my side. A lot of, there's a lot of crazy white people who are down with the – who seem to hate their own more than anybody. Yeah. You know, so who knows? I mean, it's the last thing you want to see it come to, but it just feels like we we know where the we know where this train stops. Yeah, and we just keep going full speed ahead, no breaks. We have we have living color history. 
to look back at and see how this ends or maybe black and white. Mm -hmm. And it don't end well. Well, you know, it, it comes a time that all things fall apart. Uh, this is the reason why as we sit back and look at where this, where this is going, we have tried to warn folks, but everybody's at different stages of revelation and understanding. And so my thing is, I'm going to come by you one time. Hey, man, this building's on fire. You need to get, oh, man, oh, cracker, cracker. I ain't blind. Okay, whatever. I, I got to go. Yeah. You know, you've been warned. Some people, are, that's the only way they learn. They got to be consumed by the fire. And so uh, it's hard, especially for somebody that you care about, loved ones, family members, and things like that. But, again, they have the same opportunities to observe this. But many times, what's happening in America right now, And because you're talking about this, this breaking point that's coming, People aren't hungry. You know, you got to go out of your way in America to starve, to go hungry. Even the poorest person. I mean, you got, well, I don't feel like walking over to the stew, stew pot. Well, okay, but there is something to eat, okay? And so once people get hungry, that's when you're going to see, and this is why I keep warning, you've heard me say this on my program, I warn black folks, look, you got to understand when the bow breaks, there are going to be a lot of people with some long memories about how we, as conservatives, pleaded with you, implored you, man, look, just look at this, look at the facts, look dispassionately at what, what's happening here, the open borders. This doesn't bode well for any of us. Oh, you just want me to vote Republican. No, I want you to think about what you're doing. Yeah. But because they won't take counsel, then they'll be standing around there waiting on Sally Struthers with that plastic bowl waiting for some oatmeal to get dropped in it. No, I don't want to, I don't want us to get to that point. If I, if I'm the one passing out the food i'm not going to be nearly as forgiving as god <laughs> to people who have treated me the way they have well to me it's going to be the ones who brought us to this point this is why i say to the politicians out there who are taking bribes or taking whatever they're doing whatever they're doing to sell out our freedoms you need to understand the system that you're breaking down is the system that protects you so when it's all broken down and everything's a level playing field it's purge day I'm going to be, tell you now, I'm going to be extremely narrow-minded. <laughs> I'm going to just be hard to live with. And uh, when I see some of these politicians that brought us to these point, brought us to this point of, a, this, bro, we got it good here in America. Life is good. Even poor people. You know, Clay, you got a good life. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to somebody else, they may say, Clay's, you know, he's living large. He's living in Fat City. And you say compared to, say, somebody else, man, they're living large. But at the same time, hey, man, you go home, sleep good. They sleep good. That's the beauty of America. And yet everybody keeps saying we want to level playing field, but people don't want to put in that work. Me and you talked about this whole social media thing. I said, Clay, look, so I don't got a little long in the tooth, man. I don't have that drive like that. But you've taken the bull and by the horns and ran with it, and the opportunities open up for you. It's not that they're not available to me. I'm just not pursuing them. Life is so good in America right now that we, we put people on pedestals who have – who have lost everything mm -hmm. and got it back multiple times, myself included, mm -hmm. lost it all. We, we put drug dealers on pedestals. It's gotten so good here that we put people who do wrong on pedestals. You know we don't seem to celebrate enough in America, Kim. I wasn't planning on going down this, but you opened up this can of worms for me. We don't celebrate people enough that don't lose everything, that, weren't, that aren't in recovery, mm -hmm. like people who were just managed to hold on. And then they, they didn't slip up, and they didn't fall, and they didn't, they're not in the recovery program at church, you mm -hmm. know. And, and I'm not knocking that at all. I've right. been in there. I've I've done that, mm -hmm. you know. And I, well, hell, if it wasn't for recovery, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, mm -hmm. you know. But it just says like we, we, do we love an underdog too much, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? We don't celebrate people who, gosh dang, if it wasn't for the people who didn't fall off, we, we there wouldn't be a chance for the underdogs to come back up. That's right. Sometimes, like I just don't feel like we. We just, they're normal and boring, maybe. So that's how we see it. But mm -hmm. I guess to my point, they're so good here in America that we, we don't even celebrate the people who don't fall off. Right. And I know I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but it's just been something that's been on my mind a lot lately and haven't been able to properly articulate it. I mean, I don't want to speak for Daniel, but he does a recovery podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been, he's been in recovery. I've done it. You know, the, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a big part of who we are. Right. But, the, you know, the guy that's never, never messed up and lost everything because of drugs and, we don't celebrate those people enough. You know, that observation is, is interesting from the standpoint that I have lived my life. As a matter of fact, when, I, when I've had the opportunities to speak at funerals, people ask me, would you speak on behalf of the family on um, this loved one passing, yada, yada, yada. And um, 
I always make the point to the family members that you are a living headstone to that mother, the father that's laying there in that casket. Don't worry about trying to get the biggest headstone to put on their gravesite. Live the headstone with your life, with what they walked before you and showed you, okay? Because at the end of the day, the people you just spoke of, these nondescript, and you know, I, I have to constantly remind blacks who want to, who were willing to listen, not everybody was Martin Luther King. Not everybody is one of these celebrated civil rights folks who constantly getting, every week they're getting another plaque, another certificate. I'm not denigrating or diminishing what they accomplished and what they sacrificed for. But the real heroes are those ones who went to their graves with no markers on them, who did the right thing, didn't get any accolades. You know, when I grew up, mentors weren't people with business suits and polished fingernails. They were guys with blue collars. Folks, you, you, we didn't even hold any type of functions for them. You know what we did? We called them dad, called them stepdad, stepmom. They went to work at these uh, uh, minimum wage factories and things like that, but they put three or four, five, six kids through school, kept kids out of jail, yada, yada. Those are the heroes that you're speaking of. But you know what? Because of what they're made of, they don't need that. I think about my mother, eighth grade education. She went on and got her GED, but she was better. She was more literate than I was, and I had 16 years of college. She died with a better credit rating than I did. She worked for what? Mostly less than minimum wage her whole life, her and my dad. But at the same time, they fed us. They took it. And it wasn't about that. I'm, I'm going to tell you a story, and I, and I tell this on the campaign trail. This is the story about Mama Ann Alexander. This is a real person. This is a real story. Mama Ann is 99, and I would check on her. I would call her and say, hey, Mom, how you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine, baby. I'm doing fine. Kids taking care of me real good. I got, uh, I can remember all my kids. And they, I remember your name. I said, what's my name, my man? She, Kim Wade. And so. Is that where the Kim Wade came from? No, but that's how she says it. That's good. It may have been, that may, may have been where I got it from, from hearing her say it. But she goes on to say, she went on to say, doing one of our conversations, she said, baby, I can afford a hamburger now thinking so I found I said I said you can afford a hamburger now I said what you mean ma she said well when I was raising on babies because she was born in 1925 when I was raising my kids she said we go down to fair street and the fish frying and the hamburgers be smelling so good and I'd be wanting to buy me a hamburger I'd be wanting to buy me a fish plate but I had to think I could take that same amount of money for that fish plate and buy enough food for my family for two or three days. So she, the point was the sacrifice, the awareness that she had babies, the awareness that she was looking forward to the future, okay? There's so much in that little observation. It, it's golden. And I'm saying all this about those folks who just did the right thing because it's the right thing to do. She could have spent that money on herself. And just made the kids some corn cakes or whatever else she had left in the house. But because she had that integrity and grit, that's what made America great. That's what, that's what Trump is talking about. Bringing back those qualities. Because now you got old folks who won't lead the damn stage of life. They sitting there waiting on one more plaque. Somebody honor me one more last time. She's not like that. Her headstone is her kids. Her kids are taking good care of her now. She ain't got no care in the world. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So this is what MAGA really means is getting back to those values that made America great. And when we pass it on through our kids and they're able to pull their own way because all their kids, just, just another quality about her. She's got, I guess she's 99, so she must have five. This isn't your mother. No, no, this is, this is my friend's mother who took me in after my mother died. When I say took me in, just my surrogate mother. I mm -hmm. call her my play mom. And, um, She's probably got great, great, great grandkids five generations down. If she called M, one of them, lived down in Byron, she called and said, baby, I need you to come here for a minute. 
They ain't going to say, well, so-and-so right up the street, why don't you go? They going to come. See, that's the kind of respect you get from living your life upright. You see what I'm saying? One of the last big mamas. Last big mama, but it's called home training and rearing, being reared right. You see what I'm saying? And see, they, and this is why many who denigrate the MAGA uh, 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 movement are missing out on what made America great and what will make America great, what will make their lives better because they're so busy being angry. And at 99, she's not angry with nobody. Excuse me, always pleasant, always smiling. And see, we're missing. And, and if anybody had a right in 1925 in Mississippi, yeah. bro, she done seen some things. But she doesn't have a chip on her shoulder. It, it, that's something I bring you. That's a great story, Kim. It, it's, it's humbling to hear that. Um, one of the things I talk about now is it, 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 we talk bring it 1920s Mississippi. And then you think through the 60s, through the civil rights era. You know, these people who really went through some stuff. I mean, I, you, you've you probably, I'm sure you've dealt with real racism. Actually, I have not. Really? Uh, I have not in terms of, because when I moved here in 81, you know, I was still in the Nation of Islam, which actually held me in good stead for being in Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Number one, I came in, you know, I, I was born with a bag, with a sack, and I'm going to leave with it. But I didn't walk around with a chip on my shoulders, but I was, situationally aware and I've been in every county and in the state and on my job I mean I've been literally to every county every major employer and uh, uh, what I found is that if you act a fool you'll find somebody who'll act a fool with you you kill yourself with respect accord people their respect everything goes smoothly goes back to that home training that's why I don't do racial re- reconciliation luncheons and bre- look me and you go to lunch because we enjoy each other's company mm-hmm. okay not because oh man it's almost the end of the month, man. I'm one, I'm one white boy low. I need to go to lunch with a white boy. I need to go to lunch with a black guy. I don't do no crap like that. I gotta get my racial my yeah. racial quota in. I gotta get my quota in. I'm I'm one Negro low. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Silly stuff like that, bro. I don't do that stuff, man. No, that's good stuff. Look, let's uh, I guess a hard stop there on 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 the history lesson because I sure. can talk with Kim about. The, the, his his story. He's got another great story. You have to go back and listen to his podcast. Search Kim Wade Show. First of the year. First of the year podcast. He just tells a great story in there about breaking down. I think when you're working for the phone company, maybe mm-hmm. you broke broke down out in the middle of nowhere, Delta, yeah. Mississippi, maybe, mm-hmm. and it was looking like a bad situation. It was looking like a bad situation. It ended up being the complete opposite. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to steal the thunder. Go mm-hmm. listen to the podcast. Go look, search for like January first, second, third, the third first podcast of the year. Right, and uh, we. We got it up last year and this year. Uh, we I, I do Kim's podcast for him. By the way, listen to Kim's show every Monday through Friday, 4 to 6 live on 103.9 FM. Kim is such a powerhouse in conservative talk radio that the other conservative talk radio station had to flip to sports in the afternoon because mm-hmm. they couldn't compete. That is true. And they're statewide, by the way. Yeah. So let, let that soak in. And when I call him the real Mississippi Rush Limbaugh, that's not a knock at anybody else. Mm-hmm. That's just real talk. Kim is, and he won't he he won't say it himself, but I would gladly scream it from the top of my lungs. Let's fast forward. You, you've got all this experience. You, you see things through a different lens than, frankly, a lot of black Democrats do <coughs> in Jackson. You decided, I don't know if it's official yet, but you, you're toying with the idea of running for mayor. Right. How does how does a black conservative, or how does a conservative period, win mayor in Jackson, Mississippi, in twenty? 25, I think it'll 2025. be. What, what's your plan? What makes you well, – I know what we both see in Jackson, and we know that you, you've talked about it throughout the point. We're heading to right. a bad ending right? nationally, and I, Jackson's dang near already there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what else. It, it, it can't take nothing else. It's, 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 on, it's on life support. Yeah, you, know, you decided to areas. try to make this your your last – I don't know, your last true Rob, but, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. you're, you're retired – you know, you're looking at this thing, and, you know, I, I think I might be able to save Jackson if people will just listen to me. Well, you know, the whole notion of saving anybody or anything is is obviously is kind of egotistical. But what I do believe, I believe that my life experiences uh, can be brought to bear on where Jackson is right now. I see a four-year effort uh, with the experiences that I have to bring to bear on Jackson that could – basically stabilize it and give someone else a chance to come in there and actually take it to the next level. It's kind of like with Moses. Moses was not able to go into the promised land, but he was able to get everybody over there, and then Aaron and the rest went in there. and uh, Joshua, I'm sorry, not Aaron, uh, were able to go on into the promised land. 
So sometimes your role is just to set the prep preparatory for it, you know. And that's one of the things I learned about being in talk radio. When I first started doing talk radio, man, I wanted to be national. Of course, Rush was an inspiration to all of us. And uh, I did get a opportunity, uh, Cox, Cox Broadcasting. Guy was driving through Mississippi and heard the program. Actually took the effort and called and contacted the station. And we talked. And he said, look, you got legs. He said, you have legs. And he told me what to do to try to get syndicated. And I went through the paces, and it turned out uh, that's a, that's how I ended up doing two hours. They said you got to do it. You got to be able to show you can do at least two hours. And then uh, uh, when I found out about the handcuffs that that would be required to get syndicated, in other words, depending on who you get syndicated with now, like with serious or with a serious radio, now you just go in there and just chop somebody's head off on yeah on live uh, media, but. Uh, for terrestrial radio, you have to actually put the handcuffs on. Super Talk or Super Take, as I call it, you know, they're known for putting handcuffs on their on their talk show hosts. People can do what they want, but that wasn't for me. And they said one of the things that they uh, mentioned to me was that I wouldn't be able to reference scripture or anything like that, which I don't do a lot, but I, I have more than a nod and acquaintance with God. So if it's contextual and I can bring it up and I do bring it up, they say well, those are the type of things that they, you know, you can't do really. So I, I just said, no, that's not for me. And then I realized my job is to, you know, if I'm just, I'm in a small pond, I'm basically walking my post. I'm not trying to walk your post, his post, or anybody else. Walk my post. My post will bring in a clay. You'll take the ball and run with it and take it even further. That's the game. So I've learned to be comfortable with myself, which brings me back to your question about running for the mayor of Jackson. Um. We mentioned about how well we're doing here in America as Americans. Life is good for me. My girls are squared away. Grands are good. Uh, I've done the big house thing, the big car thing. I don't have a desire for material things like that, you know. So I'm not going to steal. I don't do government contracts. Uh, my name is not associated with people who steal. Uh, so I can come in here and offer the integrity, not that I'm such a this, that, or the other, but there are things that I won't do, and I'm not going to steal, and I'm not going to take, because there's so much more that we could have, all of us. In other words, I'm coming in to show how we can slice this pie a little thinner. More people can eat. And that's one of my business philosophy has always been that way. I want everybody to eat. The reason why I want you to be able to eat as a course of us doing business together, because I want to be able to leave my garage door open. I ain't got to worry about you stealing my lawnmower or my weed eater, because you got one. Yeah. But if, if you come in there and move next door on Section 8 and you really ain't supposed to be there because, you know, you ain't put in that work to be there, then you sitting there waiting on me to go to work and figuring out how you can break in on me. So I am really into the market-based solutions, and that's what I want to bring to Jackson. The first four years, if I became mayor, what I would do, we're going to, re we're going to build self-esteem the old-fashioned way. We're going to do it by Jacksonians doing things for themselves. We're not going down there and tell the governor and Tate Reeves and white folks and other folks what they need to do for Jackson. We're going to get ourselves in a position where, man, I saw Clay over there, man. He he was working so hard at that. You know, I want to help Clay out because I saw him helping himself out. That's what we're going to do in Jackson. You know, let me ask you this. I, I've, I've ended up on the wrong side of this, trying to explain this, mm -hmm. but the guys – these guys from Rankin and Madison County that have taken it upon themselves to clean up the interstates and right. pressure wash the, uh, the the interstate ramps, you know, up under the bridge and all that, and try to clean up Jackson. I, God bless them for, for finding and, and walking it like they talk it and doing it. But I'm at this point where I think Jacksonians need to do for them themselves. And the fact that somebody else is having to come in here and you're cleaning up a mess that they made, and they're just going to make it again. We're going to get a year down the road, and it's going to look just like it was again because these guys can't be expected to make this their new hobby. You know, yeah. <laughs> 52 weeks a year, keep doing this. I mean, I, God bless them. I do not want to sound like I'm disparaging them at all. I right. know some of them. Yeah. You know, God, again, they're doing the Lord's work, deciding they want to come clean up this capital city. But the people <laughs> who, the overwhelming majority of the people, mm -hmm. don't care. Yeah. They expect you to come clean up their mess for them. You know, they're still going, you talk about littering all the time, and it's like broken windows, law mm -hmm. enforcement, littering. 
just takes a piece of crap individual. You're a piece of trash if you throw trash out your window. Mm -hmm. And just to constantly do it, you think they're going to, oh, look, it's clean. I don't want to litter. Mm -hmm. They ain't going to do that. Well, you know, that's actually one of the planks in my platform and one of my approaches to governance and what I'm offering, but I believe it's different. Uh, and I'm telling people up front so they won't be surprised. My efforts, Kim Wade's, we're going to, my administration is going to be a benefit to the producers of society, in this case, producers of Jackson, mm -hmm. people who do things right, okay? I had someone, I had a good friend of mine call me and left me a voice message. He said, what you need to do, Kim, I, you know, I understand you're running, considering running, yada, yada, yada. You need to get with the preachers and the churches and yada, 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 and get them, and they're the influencers in the community, and meet, and I, you know, I want to be considerate, but that's not where I'm going with this, because as far as I'm concerned, they're the problem, because the people throwing their trash out, they're going to their churches, so let's keep it real. Yeah. To enlist them, all, all they want is what's in it for me. I understand that, but that's not my ministry. My ministry is going to be to the producers, the gentlemen, who, the people you're talking about cleaning up the interstates, those I'm going to be working with. Because I can take that effort that they're doing there and dovetail in it, not to overtake it, but to dovetail into it. My whole thing is everybody who lives in Jackson is going to have to contribute. I don't care if you are homeless, crackhead, addicted, criminal, you got to contribute. Nobody eats for free. These bombs at the interstate exits, they need to be the ones doing this. Well, Working out their tax free, <clears throat> permit free. Yeah, Hold well, and that's, and, 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 and that's going to be my approach. Uh, we're going to mainstream everybody. Everybody's got a role to play. If your attitude is, I ain't going to do that, you ain't going to eat. We're going to harass you. We are not going to allow you to just sit up there and bring down. Every You're bringing down the property values of the people who donate to the stew pot and make your meal available to you. So we can't ask anything of you. That's not going to happen in this administration. And then we're going to have them we'll make them stand out there. First of all, they're going to get a permit. All these lawyers who go into federal court and say they have a right to, you know, okay, fine. What you can do, you can be in charge of getting them the permit. When we ride by there, you're going to have, to have your permit. You're going to have to have uh, your T-shirt on. The T-shirt going to have B-U-M on it, begging for unearned money. Boom. Yep. Booms. So we're going to do things differently. Same, because we've got too much labor standing around. And you got too much work that requires labor. So I don't see myself, you know, you got other candidates talking about what a great leader they're going to be. I'm not going to be no great leader. I'm, I'm there for asset management, okay? I got, I need four votes on the council, and I got, what, one to 2,000 city workers. Those are my constituencies. You've been involved with ISO 9,000, 2,000, whatever it was. We're going to come with that. Everybody's a client. Everybody's a customer. Yeah. So, we're going to come in and do the things that's going to make the people who make Jackson work work. When our permit the people come out to your job site, they're going to say, Mr. Edwards, what can we do to help you get in business? Not, Mr. Edwards, you're a businessman. You know how business go. Looking for money to be put in a tip job. You've, over, you, you've, you've dealt with permits in Jackson. I don't know in the last 20 years, but we were in, club, we were in the club business a couple years apart. You can walk in that building in Jackson, again, 20 years ago. You know, I got back in in 14 for about six months, right. and I couldn't get out of it quick enough. But mm -hmm. you go into that permit department, you go into that first building down, the first floor down there, here's what I'm doing. They don't know how to tell you right. what the next step is. Right. Well, here's what you need. I don't know where you do it at. What, what do you mean you don't know where I do it at? This is, you got one job. Yeah, yeah. You got one job. You should be welcoming. There should be coffee and cookies in here. Somebody mm -hmm. getting ready. The mayor should be down here shaking hands and kissing babies. Oh, law, please, you want to open a business in Jackson? I've always said the city of Jackson is in business against Jackson. Well, and see, that's and, and, and that's the basis from which my real estate background, I think, is going to hold us in good stead. Uh, number one, the city, the, the municipality, cities, their revenues come from property taxes, fines, and fees. That's it. So, we got to work with the folks who are going to be making improvements on the land so we'll have more uh, revenues coming into the city from sales taxes. What I intend to do, we're going to, we're going to work prosperity out from where it already exists. We'll take the Bell Havens, the Swan Lakes, the Heritage Hills, the Willow Woods, and places like that. We'll tell those communities, 
And we'll tell those council people over those communities and say, look, Bellhaven calls. They say, look, we got potholes over here. What I want to do the first couple years, I'm going to tell the Bellhaven community, for instance, and say, look, this is what you do. If you would go and sweep out the potholes, get them ready. We're going to come through there on X day, and we're going to fill them up. But if we got to come in here and sweep them out, clean, get it all prepped, that's time that we could be using. So we want to just want to come in here and hit it. And get and get it yeah. gone, okay? And most people would jump in. Oh, Dude, yeah, I'll do my part. You gonna do this? Listen, I'll... those communities are they're already doing that. Yeah. So once they do that, and then I would tell those communities and tell the council person over that, I said, this is what we're gonna do. Every new businesses that relocates into your community as a result of you improving the quality of life, you're gonna get one cent out of every sales dollar that comes in there, okay? Okay, we may have to go up another penny so they can get that penny. Is that similar to these special tax districts like Fondren and Bellhaven have? You could look at it like they a, that. They got a technical name. I don't it's called TIFs it and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that is for uh, the improvements. This is going to be for their wish list if they want more parks, sidewalks, sidewalks. They want to do a festival. That'll be money that they can control on the ward level. Okay, nice. Give them incentive to do that. Okay. And then we're going to, again, so as that community continues to grow, because this is what I've noticed. The people, see, if I go into the approach of running for mayor saying, Red Rover, Red Rover, everybody come over, join me. You can get a bunch of knuckleheads on there, just whatever. Steal, pickpocket, whatever they're doing over there. Uh, I want those people who want to be there. On election day, I'm looking for 50 plus one of people who want Jackson to work. There's, from the number standpoint, there's enough people who don't vote in Jackson, who didn't vote. If they came out and vote because they had hope, then we can make this thing work. And then once people see a burning bush, they can believe, then they'll start getting on board. Because I'm not going down there in some of those bombed out areas of South Jackson and try to convince those folks, man, let's clean up the neighborhood. No, it's not that we're not going to clean up your neighborhood. You're just not going to be first on the list. We're going to do those neighborhoods that require less. It's just no different than, uh, what's that guy uh, <coughs> who does the... Uh, um, financial advice thing about roll up. You pay your smallest bill up first, off first, and then roll it up to the next one. Dave Ramsey? Dave Ramsey. Okay. We're going to do the Dave Ramsey yeah. thing in government. We're going to take the communities that require less work to get them whole, and then after we get them whole, we want to come back around here for a while. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so more businesses want to fill up every vacant spot in Bellhaven or Fondren or wherever, then we're laughing because there's more revenues coming into the city, more net revenues coming into that area. And then South Jackson said, well, why are they get it? Because they're putting forth more effort. Right now, we're, you mentioned it earlier, we need to reward those people who are doing things right. Yeah, That's my approach. It ain't rocket science. Mary uh, Hawkins. Jimmy Johnson, yeah. great Cowboys head coach. Mm -hmm. I treat my rock stars different. <laughs> Good yeah. point. I treat my superstars different. You know, you, you want to be a Good superstar? You, you, want, you want special treatment? You earn it. Yeah. And I that's the that's the that's how government that's how everything should be. When I my twelve years in the car business, when I was selling twenty cars a month, mm -hmm. do whatever I wanted to do. Right. But you know what? To sell twenty cars <clears> a month, <throat> I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Right. I had to work my ass off. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of like a catch yeah. twenty two. But man, they sure made me feel like I had the freedom to right. do whatever. But you knew I had to be there from bell to bell, yeah. six days a week to, mm -hmm. to to be the top guy. Right. And you know that it takes yeah. twenty four seven three sixty five commitment. Got, and see, this is what I'm saying. Uh, in America, people just aren't hungry enough. In my in my opinion, the problem what they have what they talk about workforce participation missing. Problem is people have too many options. When our parents was coming along, if they caught on a job somewhere, your dad knew he had to feed everybody. He, look, he gonna work until they ran him off. Nowadays, people walk off a job ain't got nothing. To, don't have another job planned. And so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna reestablish a pecking order on who gets what. Why should we give somebody whose only contribution to society is that they got pregnant at 16, 17, 18, 19, whatever, and uh, the mother, grandmother who don't worked all their life can't get any food stamps, you know, and the people who ain't done anything put into the system getting everything they need. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to have a pecking order to it. Uh, we're just going to basically just make people be responsible. Yeah. If you're ready for prime time, you say you, if you're old enough to vote, then you're old enough to pull your weight. All right, let, let's do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I know, he knows, she knows, everybody knows what Jackson's real problem is. It's these out-of-control juvenile delinquents. Mm -hmm. 
what are we going to do about, I think we need to bring back, a, not just JPD. There needs to be an entire police force. It's just truancy that just focuses on these damn out-of-control kids. What, what, it's the schools is what yeah. I'm working towards here. The, until the school district's back being somewhat commendable, you know, anything other than the embarrassment it is right now, people aren't going to move to Jackson with families that can. Mm-hmm. It's going to continue to be urban flight of every race. Right. People who people who want better for their kids are getting the hell out of Jackson right now. They're getting to a better school district. I was out in Bellhaven the other night. First time I've been out in Jackson other than Martin's in a while. Sean taught me into coming out and mm-hmm. his, uh, his buddy Renee. And I just sat there and talked to people all night. You know, just hear, hearing people's stuff. And even the people that disagreed with me <coughs> all said, but if I had kids, I wouldn't live here. Right. right. And you're like, how do you fix that? Right. Well, to me, it's, it's, it's not impossible. It's not, uh, it's not. Well, the mayor, the mayor picks the school board members in Jackson, right? See, I mean, that's a start. Yeah. And I attempted, I, I made a request to speak with the superintendent of schools. See, we, in my opinion, we make things overly complicated. We got several things that we can knock out just by one non-expenditure uh, uh, change. And I've said this, give teachers absolute control over who sits in their classroom. You got a classroom with 25 kids. You got one knucklehead that's disrupting a 45-minute class session. So you got 25 kids who didn't get their lesson. So they're not prepared for the SAT, the quarterly test, or anything else, right? Mm -hmm. So you get that knucklehead out so she can get those lessons. You got 24 who could at least keep up on the academic side. If a child can read and write, they're less likely to drop out of school, okay? What did that cost us? Nothing. That child is not getting put out on the streets. That child's getting put out of the classroom. The, the principal and all the white shirts down there, they got their jobs because they went and told the school board, man, I'm, dude, I know this. I know how to get these kids popping. I can get them at, okay, so now you get to work your magic, Okay. We got them out of the classroom, 24 getting theirs. Now you can work your dope boy magic with your specialties that you've been claiming you had. All right? I don't care what you do with them. You're not putting them out on the street so Derek Johnson and NAACP and Southern Poverty Law Center can't say you're putting out too many black kids or too many white kids or whatever. You're, I don't know what you're doing with them. You just do it. Yeah. So now the teacher's happy because now, okay, I don't have that headache. I'm not going home wore out from dealing with some knuckleheads. Teachers don't mind coming to school, so you have a happier teacher, right? But that's got to have a trickle-down effect. Right. That's my whole point. Yeah. All right, so now let's let's say we solve that problem. So we cut down, because at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is diminishing the number of juvenile delinquents pushed into society every year. Because there's always been juvenile delinquents. What we have is an unmanageable number. Let's get that number down to a manageable number. Then we can get the system back balanced. Everything is about a balanced system. When you, if you take in more food than you let out, you got issues. You let out more than you take in, you got issues. Your system is not balanced. Sure. Same thing here. We talked about the data plant, Amazon data plant, creating 2,000 jobs. Blacks complain, well, why can't we get a data plant here in Hines County? Well, here's the deal. Don't make a difference where it is at the end of the day. Because if they're giving that data plant 10 years tax abatement, it ain't like you can get anything from them if they moved in Hines County. Mm-hmm. You get the benefit of the jobs of 2,000 uh, homes that have an income that could stabilize, you know, a family of four, whatever. And, and spend money in the community, which right. is tax money. So you, your goal is what? To get those 2,000 folks to relocate to Jackson. Yeah. They're not going to do it if your schools ain't working. So if you took the steps that I suggested about controlling the classroom and the learning is taking place, the teacher's happy, you got the better teachers, you got kids who are graduating with the capabilities and the abilities to read and write, you got happy students, happy parents, happy employers. It's a feeding effect. It's not rocket science. But they tell you, no, we got to have something special. No, you don't. You just got to have a determination. So two, two things. I've heard you talk about, what are those, uh, what are those special schools? That, is it magnet schools? Magnet schools. Like you've talked about, they should have put a magnet school in this other place over off Mill Street maybe? or, or No, what it was, the the – Midtown Charter School was Charter. Part, that's the one yeah, I was looking for. Yeah, it seems like Char- school choice would also help uh, families in Jackson. Okay, I can live here, and my kid can go to. Well, that's what they're working on in the legislature right mm-hmm. now. Which, if they pull that off, it is that that will be a game changer. Yeah, that benefits you great if you want to live in Jackson. 
if you're out in the county and you're already in a good school, I feel like it hinders you a little bit because now you're having to. Well, if you're already it. in a good school, it's, it's, it's almost like it's, it's not even an issue. I mean, your money, because all you're getting back is your money to go where you want to go. There's still going to be a cap on how many, you know, everybody can't just decide, we're sending them to Pearl and yeah. a thousand extra well, I mean, no, they can't do a cattle car. In other words, they just can't make it, you yeah. know, everybody at one in one year. But as people, people, the marketplace is going to determine where the good schools are. Mm -hmm. And the good schools are where the rooftops are going to be. And so Jackson keeps talking about that they're being discriminated. Well, not just Jackson, but areas that are Democrat controlled say that they're being, it's not that people don't want to be around your crap and you don't want to change mm -hmm. and you're arrogant about it. And people say, look, with all due respect, I don't need the hassle. You know, if you want to you know, do what you want to do, we'll just build more prisons. But at the end of the day, I'm not sacrificing my kids on the altar of your foolishness. End of story. So explain the charter school thing. You, you, you've been fired up about it. I, I, you know, obviously, let's see your show a good the, bit. It, what, 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 <clears throat> how does a charter school, because I'm not very familiar with them. My kid's out of school, mm -hmm. and I mean, I just not that, that's not my hot button. But obviously, I understand the importance of a good school district because basically without that foundation, you don't have anything else. And we're seeing right. that in a large part of Jackson, or all of it for the most part. Um, what, what does a charter school do, and what does Kim Wade do to – help move that forward first of all the the charter schools just give parents who want their kids to learn and kids who want to learn an option and a uh, place to go to do that uh, it's similar to a magnet school type things like kids well, actually want to go and they're not going there to play sports and all that stuff they're going to pretty much i mean it's, we're just talking the magnet schools were created within these school districts for the elites mm -hmm. and the white shirts to send their kids to you know, when you hear a David a private school within a public school system, yeah, right? When you hear people like David Blunt say, "Oh, I sent my kids to public schools," yeah, they sent them to the. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with it because as a parent, they're doing what a parent's supposed to do. Sure. And but the question is, if you know you can create a a magnet school that is worthy of your kids, you know how to do the job. You're just yeah. not doing it. And do you realize that that's the reason why they want uh, affirmative action and DEI because they're only basically making room for about ten percent of blacks and minorities who get access to the good jobs, we're only making about 10% mm -hmm. available. That's why DEI, we're going to force you to take some folks so they have an outlet because otherwise you'll have all that steam in that teapot with no outlet. And so this is it's all a scam at the end of the day. And this is why parents who advocate and get out and throw some sharp elbows on behalf of their kids are the ones you find there in charter schools. The charter schools do more with less the public schools, uh, folks will tell you, well, the charter schools just taking our best students. No, they're taking the students who want to learn. You shouldn't have to go learn beside little Pookie and them. That are that are, that are, it's just a daycare for them. Well, if, if little Pookie don't want to learn, that's why I said it's important if the teacher could put little Pookie out of her classroom, mm -hmm. then learning can take place. They're not willing to do that. They keep saying well, we need to mainstream everybody. Well, wait a minute now. You're mainstreaming everybody at the expense of my child who's going to be passing through this grade one time. And I'm sorry. I'm not going to make that sacrifice on behalf of your ego and your sense of compassion. That's not going to happen. And so this is why it's important that people be resolute. We've got to be just as resolute on things that we believe in as they are about the things they believe in. 100%. Kim, we're, we're, we're running a little long on the tooth. I could do this for three or four hours. <clears throat> it, it, kind of in closing here, what <laughs> crimes, obviously, the the – the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. What is a what is a Kim Wade administration? How, how, what do you do to tackle that? Do you defer more to say Capitol Police get them, let them expand further into the city? Do you bring in somebody? Actually, I like Chief Wade. You know, at least on the surface, he appears to be doing a great job. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm guessing you talked about golden handcuffs earlier. Well, Chief Wade's probably got some golden handcuffs on him. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do to expand JPD? What, where do you do you find more money to try to pay guys more? What does Kim Wade do for crime? I think it comes down to more about consequences for the crime than it does trying to fight the crime. Um, some people think differently. Uh, well, Sean, for example, thinks that he don't he don't think people are thinking about the consequences when they commit crimes. And coming from a uh, assistant DA, I can't I can't argue with him on that either. You you have dogs, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so if your dog run off a <clears throat> miscreant near do well, house burglar, whatever. Is that good enough for you? I mean, they kept your house from getting. That's good enough, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's my. That's going to be my approach to crime. Uh, as I've sat back and looked at this here, there's certain criminals 
certain bad guys or potential bad guys you don't want in the system. You know why? Because it's just the system. Many of them know how to work the system. That's why when the goon squad was in the news, I called the goon squad, the goon squad Knights Templars. They were doing the work that, you know, other folks won't do. Uh, we will do community policing. I say it with tongue in cheek, but I want officers to know that I got your back. All I ask for is plausible deniability. Yeah. Okay. I want you to handle uh, the affairs in your precinct that you're patrolling the way you want to patrol, the way you want to handle it. The body cameras are turning them off and on is an option. You will not be penalized for turning your camera on or off. Now you got to understand it cuts both ways. It could exonerate you or it could implicate you. But if you see a situation where, you know what, let me turn this camera off. Uh, Mr. Edwards, step out your car. Yeah. And they explain the program to you. Oh, okay, so you don't want me doing this in your precinct. Gotcha. 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 That's how they explained it to me. Yeah. When I and was so what age. happens? Now they don't have, the officer's not spending two hours after his shift doing paperwork. He's not getting caught up in Jody Owens's, you know, treadmill over there with all the paperwork Jody has. And uh, we pre prevented people from having the hassle of crimes. There's a gentleman, <laughs> sadly enough, one of the finest officers, and I still like him to this day. I don't care what uh, he's been convicted of. Mark, Big Mark, they called him Bowlegs. He was the police officer in our precinct over in Precinct 3 off State Street. And uh, he caught every house burglar who operated in our neighborhood over 20 years. Every, he caught every last one. Yeah, you might gotten, you may have gotten your house broken into, but he gonna he gonna he gonna find out. He gonna he gonna get you, and he did that. And so much of it was, they, a couple of them did end up doing some time, but for the most part, he would just explain the program to them, mm -hmm. and they got the message. And so, basically, we're going to go to community policing the old-fashioned way, uh, when they had Kojak. I don't know if you knew Kojak. Knew of Kojak. That was, I remember Kojak. Yeah. Uh, Kojak, Gladney, Gladney, that yeah, whole bunch. Yeah, yeah. We, we're going back to community policing, and uh, and I'm telling the officers now, all I want is plausible deniability. And I, I will be concerned with the officers' performance if they come in after two or three shift changes and they got the same heel on their boot. If they don't come in there with a heel broke off their boot and it's plugged in somebody's backside somewhere in their precinct, then I'm assuming that they're not really about that life. They're not yeah, about their job. It feels like to me in Jackson, you could chase all the bad guys you want to. Yeah. It's like writing tickets on 55. Yeah. You, you should have to write 10 a day. Well, the bottom line <laughs> is criminals are just like, look, okay, if you got caught doing something or about to do something, and they say, well, I'm going to let you go, but don't do it here. Yeah. Okay, you may just get to the point where you just, I don't do it, I'm not going to do it around him. But at least you're thinking. Because beforehand, you were just first person I see, I'm snatching them up. You know, I'm put them tools on them. And so the bottom line is, when I stayed out in West Jackson, when I first moved here, the first house I bought was over on Columbia. And I, I lived over there, didn't have any problems. I had all my parts out on my little side porch, little screened-in porch. Nobody ever broke in on me. Then we had apartment duplex across the street. Guy moved in. A woman moved in, and her nephew would come over there. And everything, people started getting stuff missing and, and we figured out it was him. I, I, I told him one day, I said, look, bro, I said, you ain't the only one to get up 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and do something devious. <laughs> I said, no, nah, well, there won't be anybody. Ain't gonna, anybody going to call 911, but I'm just letting you know. If any of my stuff come up missing, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be extremely narrow-minded. You're going you gonna to be hard-pressed to convince me you ain't done it. Oh, no, no, doctor. I never got. I got broken into when I moved to Woodhaven. They were breaking in there like they had a key. <laughs> but. You know, the bottom line is people do what they can get away with. What they know they can get away with. If they know they can't get away with it, they ain't going to do it. You know, in, in Jackson and, frankly, Hines County in general, it, I feel like too many people <clears> are scared <throat> to just put a cap in the bad guy like because they worry about the criminal justice system. At the end of the day, more than anything, the water, the crime, any of it, mm -hmm. I moved to Rankin County mm -hmm. because I knew if my white ass had yeah. to shoot somebody that was trying to take mines, mm -hmm. I was going to be the one that was the defendant. Right. And we, so we, we got to get Jackson. We got to get the good guys feeling like they can protect themselves from the bad guys. I know the mayor can't, ain't 100% responsible for that, 
It can definitely set a tone through the way the police department is policed, the way those police reports get reported, right. mm-hmm. and the way uh, evidence is collected. And, you know, the DA can only prosecute what he well, has. The good guys, be they police or just citizens, don't feel like anybody's got their back. And that's uh-huh. why I'm saying, you know, for a while there, you know, it may come down to where the city has to pay out a couple hundred thousand dollars to, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe. Okay, they put some braille marks on his head. But this mayor got him doing it now. Yeah. That's, my yeah. that's my whole point. Yeah, That's my whole point. That, okay, once they get the message, just like when uh, the Capitol Police came first, you know, they got the nickname the Jump Out Boys. Mm-hmm. Because and now people realize, oh, man, these folks here, yeah, you know, you don't want none of the heat. Was talking about it today. Yeah. When uh, they haven't had, uh, when I stopped to get my haircut on the way here, mm-hmm. the guy was talking about, uh, he was getting his haircut in front of me, he was talking about the Capitol Police. I said, yeah, you know, I said, they hadn't really had to make a lot of news lately. I said, they've they've set an example. They made a set a tone for how you're going to act inside the CCID. Right. And he said, ah, the Jump Out Boys. I mm-hmm. mean, they, we made that name famous, right. celebrating their accomplishments. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I'm always looking for new ways to issue my F around and found, found out grand championship. <laughs> and I've been, I've been having to give it to uh, to Pearl more times here lately because Capitol Police have set an example of how and, you and that, look, over there. Like I said before, America has devolved down into gangs. Yeah. You, you got your White House gang. You got your U.S. Marshals, the FBI, CIA, uh, judicial gang. Everybody's got a gang. MS-13, Crips, Blood, and what you, you spoke of earlier. MAGA. <laughs> yeah, MAGA. You spoke of uh, uh, things hitting the wall, collapsing, yada, yada, yada. And at that point, there's going to be it's, it's going to be a purge, and this is why I keep telling people all the time. You think I'll be joking on this? I'm serious. You got to have some killers on your team yeah. at the end of the day, because what we're dealing with are these young folks. Man, these folks are sociopaths. They'll kill you. They have no respect for the value of human life. When you got 14 year olds killing 13 year olds, <laughs> 30 year olds, whatever. I mean, they have no. They don't think about it. We used to. I was always scared of even punching somebody. <clears throat> And killing them on accident. Mm-hmm. Not because I think I'm a killer, right. but I knew that the consequences and repercussions was Clay spending the rest of his life in jail. Like a, a, a name a lot of my followers will recognize a Barry Goff. Right. Not that dude out at the dot that time and killed him. Mm-hmm. Oogie, I believe his name was. And he spent the rest of his life in prison, but he was that guy that fought a lot. Right. I was like, you know, it was like he's spending the rest of his life in prison. Mm-hmm. It seems like that doesn't happen enough anymore. Well, I'll tell you one of the things that <laughs> being named Kim. And I didn't get a nickname. I don't have a middle name. It's just Kim. Kim. So that kind of, look, oh, with a name like Kim, man. going to jail is not an option. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so if you want to keep your child out of jail, either raise them as conservative or give them a name like Kim. And yeah. uh, that'll break a lot of that. Learn up how to fight. <laughs> yeah. I'm too light in the butt to be going to jail. So I said, uh, nah. Uh, you know, wrapping it up with this, I I, I would love, Kim, you're involved in jujitsu. We, we, we're so light-minded on so many different levels. I, I, I think with these younger kids, not the ones, not not the ones that are idiots that can't that you can't do nothing with, right? But the kids are just on the fringe. I think you know, getting them involved and cleaning up, cleaning the city up, getting back to that kind of stuff, making them go take jujitsu. Mm-hmm. I mean, just all kind of learning some damn discipline. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe if their fathers and the mothers ain't gonna do it at home, to an extent, it takes a village. And uh, we're not doing anything right now except teaching them how to be professional victims mm-hmm. when they screw up. I think once you kind of get that rolling, you can clean up a lot of this. If Bill Haven and Fonder can be safe, so can South Jackson. Well, the thing is, you catch these kids between 9 and 13, and that's part, that's part of my approach as uh, if I were to become mayor, and that would be uh, all these pastors that I've been told to talk to. Uh, we will – I'm, I'm going to be urging the Ronnie Crudups of the world, the uh, Bishop uh, uh, Jerry Young and uh, – uh, What's the guy on New Jerusalem guy, uh, uh, Dwayne Pickett, and others? Take some of your money, hire your people to go pick up paper, okay? Through the organization that uh, the gentleman who's doing that on 55, they've already got a foundation, okay? And we can take some of that money for some of the smaller entities that don't have the resources to pay kids. But I think if you take a child between 9 and 13, work their butts hard, but pay them. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, they can sit up at the uh, 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 soda shop like a big shot, order them a chili dog and a root beer float, yada, yada, yada. They got their own money. It changes the way. You ain't got to do two or three years of mentoring. Once they get used to having their own money, it did it for me. And so I ain't talking about something that's proprietary has never been done before. We're just going back to what? We're making America great again. Again. That's it. Again, again.
again. Kim Wade, my brother, my mentor, my friend, uh, twice in life you've, you've, you've helped me point me in a direction that I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. And you've never, you've never hesitated to give back, and that's why you told me early, early on, first, week, first time we talked about it, he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you, but you got to help the next generation. I pretend I'm 20. I'm 46. It's time to start helping the other generation now. Um, I've got Daniel, motivated Daniel here to start doing this. Mm-hmm. I've helped others because you you pointed me in the direction of, hey, don't forget where you came from. Mm-hmm. Help others. Set up the next generation. You walk it like you talk it, my friend. Try and that's why, I know it, that's why I know you'll be good for the city of Jackson because you walk it like you talk it. You don't do anything that you don't ask somebody else to do. I'm sorry. Anything you ask somebody else to do, I know you're doing it, and uh, leading by example, and that's the best way to do it. So right. I, I think you're the man for the job, and you all obviously have you. my full support. I know people kind of chuckle when we say Kim Wade because they just don't think a conservative, mm-hmm. not not at no disrespect mm-hmm. to you, but they just can't imagine that somebody that as a Trump supporter could possibly win in Jackson. Mm-hmm. What twenty three thousand people, thirteen thousand people voted in Jackson. Mm-hmm. I think there's fifteen twenty well, thousand people is, who are fed up. Clay, let me say this: going out the door yeah. here. Uh, my candidacy, should it materialize, because it won't be until the new year that I would actually make the formal application, mm-hmm. uh, is this. I'm not asking people to vote for Kim Wade. I'm asking people to vote for the ideals that I'm presenting, okay? And I'm telling them I will be a standard bearer for these ideals, this approach to governance, okay? Because I don't want to get into this where, uh, man, I need – I don't need my ego stroked. I know who I am. I don't need my resume enhanced, and I'm not looking for a job. I want a do. I want to do a job, but Marcus is running because he want Mar- Marcus wants to be mayor. Marcus Choke, Wallace, yeah, Marcus. Marcus is a good guy. I ain't a problem with Marcus. Chokeway's running because he wants to be mayor. Chokeway wants to be mayor. Yeah. Okay. Um, they say Ronnie Crudup Jr. may run. Fine. All these people are welcome to come on the show in between now and then. I don't even have to be there. Tell, tell. I want people to have options. So I'm asking people to vote for the program. If Marcus adopts the platform, dude, support Marcus. I ain't got no problem with that. I will not lose sleep. Mm-hmm. If Chokeways changes his ways and start working the, pro, uh, the, the, the proposal, because I know they work. They work in Madison. They work all over the country. What they're doing doesn't work. There's nowhere in the country they can show and point to that the approach – Chokeway's taken or the approach that Marcus is proposing. Free land don't work. It don't work. You know, if you are, let's just say, we're not going to be dealing with the angry Negro crap anymore, okay? We're going to go on here and work with those people who want Jackson to work. If you have the coldest ice in town, you're the best engineer, and you bid on it, you get it. But we're not going to continue to pay 20, 25 cents on a dollar extra just so we can say we got a black guy or a white guy or a gay guy to do the job. You win the bid outright. Your job is to make Jackson look good. If you're not doing that, Hoss, you're going to have some problems on your next bid. The, the, the set aside, pro, the minority set aside program is right. Is, 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 put out, well, here is it, it is. going to get its own tombstone? Well, the, the thing is, they can still bid. Yeah, you're just not going to get because at the end of the day, Jackson is majority black. Yeah. So all it is just other blacks are tithing to you. Mm-hmm. So you can walk around and say I'm the richest man in the room. Nah, Hoss. What we're all about is everybody's got to eat. We're going to slice this pie a little thinner. And you're going to be a participant in it. You're not going to be the one who's. Cause look, I ain't no problems with you making a uh, profit. These folks want to make a killing. You're not going to make a killing under under Kim Wade administration. You can make a good profit. Plenty of work to be done in Jackson. Uh, if you if you're not scared to work, I sold a guy a couple of hats yesterday, mm-hmm. and he has a, a roofing company, construction company. He said he turned down a job in Jackson. The guy offered him <coughs> twice the money to do the roof. He said, "I ain't doing it. You got to find somebody else." Point being. If you're willing to deal with the Jackson mm-hmm. stuff, there's a lot of money to be made if you're willing to go there and do it. And uh, so I don't know if there's, there's not necessarily a need for a minority set-aside program in Jackson. Well, what it is, many many have gotten comfortable, and many of the people who were the early participants in the program, they they should have moved on. Mm-hmm. They should be the Yates and the Hemp Hill comparables, and they have not because it's begun. Look, it, it's had to be. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, Clay, keep in mind, all of this is an economy. You know, racism, race relations. It's just like racism, the, industrial complex. Right. It's just like the catfish industry, the blues industry, the farm industry, the timber industry. It's an industry. Yeah. You got movers and players, movers and shakers. And all I'm saying is, guys, there's a new sheriff in town. That's all. Yep. Kim Wade, thank you, brother. Appreciate Y'all you, man. Tune in every Monday through Friday, uh, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. for my show. <laughs> 
4 to 6 for Kim's 103.9 FM WYAB. Both of our shows are podcast across all podcast platforms. Search Kim Wade Show. Search Clay Edwards Show. Hit subscribe. If you can't listen live, you can listen on demand. Either one of them. And uh, maybe as we get closer to the time for Kim to make an announcement, we can come back and do this again. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Yep.